Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 807. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 20th, 2023. <gasps> That's not Sasquatch behind me. Do you have a cafeteria in your RV, Kevin? No. <laughs> We're here getting the uh, the generator serviced on our rig before we head out west into the Badlands. Where we're going to do some boondocking, so we need to have power. So I'm here at a Cummings location in Des Moines, Iowa, and I'm in the cafeteria. Which means uh, we're, we're probably under con- some time constraints before they all come up here and have lunch. You mean you don't use as home decor, EEOC, uh, and workers' comp posters? No, no. And no. I, I looked around here. I think they have every one that they're supposed to have posted, posted, except for the latest transgender posting that comes from the Department of uh, Labor. But you know they're they're up to date here in Des Moines at the at the the Cummings uh, Diesel Shop. So that's good. You know, this is why you don't need a union. You're completely covered by the Department of Labor. George, how are you doing this week? I still can't find my uh, I I ear things whatever airpods yes airpods uh i tried using find my find my iphone function and it says Mm -hmm. can't be found so it means the battery is run out dead yeah so they which means they haven't been pinched by somebody so they're not in uh some baggage handler's back pocket so i just have to keep looking otherwise i look like i'm you know all i need is a little morse code telegraph key and uh, i'll play the part well, you're the person uh, who you you lost your passport for eight months once, so I can't. You know, yeah, you you are not a a person who always keeps things tediously in front of you, and that's why you're great on the show. You know, this is unscripted. I can't have a person who can just script things in their head. I need somebody who can speak eloquently and uh, impromptuly, and that's what you do very well. So we're headed off to the Badlands. And I'll be putting pictures on Facebook. If you are not a Facebook friend, uh, uh, you can become a Facebook friend of Kevin or George. We, we don't mind that at all. If you want to follow us on Facebook and our travels, uh, there's a Facebook page called Pretending We're Retired. And that's uh, Kevin and Jill as we travel uh, the nation here working full time and driving full time. If, if you're going through Iowa, are you following the old Oregon Trail the pioneers took uh, 150 years ago out west? No, but next year we're taking Route 66 from Chicago to San Diego. So that's that's an upcoming feature of our show. All right, George, we should get on to the news here. Uh, so my original diocese when I was an Episcopalian is the Diocese of Wisconsin. Not the Diocese of Wisconsin. Diocese, what, what was Madison covered? Must be Milwaukee. That, that's in Milwaukee. Yeah, Milwaukee. Uh, it's so long ago, I can't remember this stuff. So the Diocese of Milwaukee, the Diocese of Fond du Lac, and the Diocese of Eau Claire have standing committees, and those standing committees have voted unanimously to form or to start to form a single diocese called the Diocese of Wisconsin. This is big news because, um, for the most part, uh, up until the 1970s, the Episcopal Church in Wisconsin was pretty strong, George. Yes, it. Um, Fond du Lac and Eau Claire were bastions of the Anglo-Catholic movement. Mm-hmm. Bill Watland of the ACNA, and now been in Fort Worth for a while, sure. was Bishop of Fond du Lac. Uh, but they, the Wisconsin diocese have been the victims of demography and Episcopal Church wokery. Uh, Fond du Lac is northern part of the diocese and northern northern Wisconsin like many parts of rural America is emptying out uh, kids when they finish high school they don't want to if they don't want to stay on the farm uh, they go they leave they go to the big cities and there's less and less people and you know the the ability to maintain an Episcopal church you need you really need like a hundred people minimum to support the cost of a priest. And if you don't have that, then you have a half-time priest or somebody who's split between two, three, four different parishes, and that's never satisfactory. So less people come. So Fond du Lac, uh, which is still a predominantly Anglo-Catholic diocese, has been suffering from the rural flight. Uh, Eau Claire, to the west of uh, 
in the western staff of the state still has some major towns and cities but it too is seeing rural flight and milwaukee which is primarily uh suburban you know america is seeing the consequences of episcopal kookiness so that their acna plants doing quite well in the, the uh, southeast corner of wisconsin and mm -hmm. you know i assume they'll be planning you know places in college towns like marquette and uh uh, the, the good thing about a new church start is that you can sort of cherry pick uh, where you want to put your churches. So Madison may be the kook capital of uh, of the United States, maybe along with Austin, Texas, but cool. still it's a place where you can build a good Bible-believing church if, if uh, because there's enough people to do so. And, and I have to agree because we went to a church in Madison called Madison Anglican Church. It uh, meets at a, uh, um, a religious college in the downtown Madison, and they're a strong church. Um, they put together this over a couple of years, and uh, strong theologically, and a, a nice diverse student population goes there, and a lot of people my age go there. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're pulling in uh, a lot of, uh, I'd say, ex-tech, uh, you'd call mm -hmm. it, but uh, in the same way some families moved here from Church of the Resurrection, this is part of the Diocese of the Upper Midwest, uh, to help th start this church, and it's working very well. Um, it's just one of those things that works in this dynamic where uh, there's a vacuum to fill. Mm -hmm. People desire a church that's good in fellowship, great in teaching, that will bring their kids up in the faith, and that isn't kooky. And yeah, I can find, find that here in, in uh, different locations in, in Wisconsin, sometimes not in tech. Well, and, and also, with like, if, if ACNA moved into, say, Kenosha or West Allis, one of these older mill towns, that you can get cheap property, hmm. but you're, you don't have, if you will, the natural Anglican constituency that you have been Madison or in Marquette or in the Milwaukee suburbs. Yeah, I think that's true. There, I mean, there, there is a church that meets just outside of Kenosha, and they're struggling, and they're struggling because they don't have that generational uh, tech dynamic. And, um, and there's lots of reasons churches struggle. Um, but I think not having that generational understanding of liturgy is um, uh, something that stops people from understanding how the Anglican churches work. So. We have, we have that rural flight here where we are in this mm -hmm. part of Florida. Uh, none, when the teenagers finish high school and if they go away to college, they do not come back mm -hmm. uh, because they go to Tampa or they find jobs around the country because we don't have an industrial base here. Uh, we have a service industry base and in agriculture. Uh, and you know, the one, one fellow who is staying uh, I'm very pleased to say we now have an electrician in the church hey. because he he went through the he decided to go to trade school and he's uh, uh, starting his six year apprenticeship to be a fully whatever they are certified licensed uh, electrician. So now, uh, I've heard a that, rumor. That, that guy's staying, yeah, but uh, uh, his, you know, his sister it? didn't. I've heard a rumor that there's, there's a huge shortage of uh, tech priests to fill his vacancies. You know, I don't know how real that is, but um, there's not enough seminarians uh, to, to fill the vacancies, and there's churches that are looking that can't find a priest who apparently have money to hire a priest. Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. There's always been a tremendous shortage of good clergy. Yes. I mean, <laughs> the, and um, so that, that's not new. And but what is getting worse and worse is that there's a shortage of clergy willing to go to Kenosha or West Dallas or to the Rosebud Sioux Reservation, places that are not uh, uh, tourist destinations, if you will, and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. In Florida, we have no problem attracting clergy um, because we have people, I, if you're a poor parish and you can't uh, pay your own way, you can always find some re, some retiree who will work mm -hmm. for nothing uh, who, or for a modern, mo modest stipend. You don't see that in the Midwest, uh, in the North, in upstate New York and things like that, simply well, because of di demographic moves. I remember in 1997 or 1998, I was on a search committee for a church, Christ Church Parish in Waterton, Connecticut, and 
there were lots of conservative um, priests at the time, but of the priests that we were allowed by the bishop to interview and seek, three were liberal, one was conservative. Mm-hmm. He, would, he, he didn't want his diocese full of conservative priests, so he would limit the options. And, oh, that's uh, very true. Yeah. And, and to be frank, Central Florida, Florida, other dioceses do it in the opposite way, mm-hmm. um, where the you people apply and then the uh, uh, bishop uh, tosses out those who do not conform to his mind of the church. So, some, some be, and because there are more liberal bishops than conservative bishops, more li- many, many, many more dioceses by a factor of 20, yeah. liberal dioceses than conservative dioceses, the fewer conservative dioceses don't really have a problem attracting clergy because uh, people want to escape from kooky and crazy bishops, um, but it's the liberals who have a problem. So but then again, uh, some places will always be attractive. People always will want to go to New York City. People will always want to go to, uh, you know, parts of California and whatnot. Yes. So on to our next story. Uh, if I were in a Church of England cafeteria, I probably wouldn't see a whole lot of uh, Department of Labor uh, bulletins and placards. Uh, I don't know how much protection a clergy person has in the employment of the Church of England, because I just saw a story where 2,000 of them have joined a union, George. Unite is a service union that has many different branches, and the 2,000 clergy and church worker members of Unite have put a wage uh, grievance out there. It's the first time there's union action by clergy saying that the wages of clergy need to be raised to keep up with inflation. Now, this is important for several reasons, not just labor news, but first it speaks to the failure of the leadership of the Church of England, that its clergy feel the need to get an outsider, a union involved to see that they're treated fairly and equitably. Uh, Second, it speaks to the massive misallocation of resources within the Church of England, where they can spend 100 million on reparations, 11 million on uh, re- redoing Lambeth Palace Library, but then they have uh, some clergy in deprived parts of the country living in utter penury. Um, hundred, it used to be parishes were self-funding from lands around at the, the Glebe lands and things like that. And then I think it was in the seventies or eighties or sometime in the modern era, all of that was put under national control to make it equitable. So, because there were some churches that had really great, you know, pay for their clergy because they were in wealthy places and had a lot of farmland they rented. And then there were other poor churches that couldn't, you know, rub two nickels together. The result has been the national church has sucked the money out of the life of the parish church. And wages for clergy have not kept up with uh, the world. In the United States, in the I'll speak of the Episcopal Church, which I know, um, my salary, I've, I'm a priest with a church of a certain size, and I've got 28 years seniority. My pay is on a grid. And I just happened to check this, and it's basically exactly the same pay as if I were a colonel, a, a, colonel, a lieutenant colonel in the army with 28 years. In other words, my salary, and if you look at it, it basically matches. Military salaries for officers match from a curate as a second lieutenant to a four-star general and a bishop. They match that. In the Church of England, a lieutenant colonel in the army with my amount of service would make about 85,000 pounds a year. A priest of my size church and my seniority would probably make in the mid-20s, maybe a little higher. That's, 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 that's incredible, George. I mean, and what, and here's the thing is that, and it's, it's, it's not just clergy. We're, we saw a strike by junior barristers, by junior doctors. The professional classes are being squeezed to death in England, the clergy, uh, doctors, but the lawyers, yeah, but not bishops. Not well, no, not bishops. They have not, very nice not places D, to live. Not DEI officers, not union. You know, I mean, 
there's yeah the clergy are being squeezed in the church in england but uh, everybody else is doing just fine george they've got billions of dollars in the uh in the ch- the church commissioners and the money is spent on these projects that will achieve nothing these evangelism projects that you know all this hype and all this money and all this than that and all they do is they just um they suck the real the work of the church is done by the by the parish priest that's the front line worker uh diocese of leicester is famous or infamous for wanting to create these minster communities merging 10 20 30 churches into one great minster community with four or five priests to shuttle it around uh, an area to cover everybody. Um, and they're doing this in the in, because of cost savings. Well, I got a tweet from the Diocese of Leicester saying they're looking for another diversity and inclusion officer who will provide nothing to the growth of the church, who will provide you know no growth, no no income, if you will, if you want to look at it a business model. But the diocese with women's advisors, minorities advisors, interfaith advisors, archdeacons, area deans, rural deans, all these people, um, communications officers, all this nonsense, uh, which provides no real growth to the church. That's money taken away from supporting parish priests. And you are not going to grow a church by having an absentee priest who shows up one, you know, one Sunday in four, um, or does your funeral and baptism and that's it. You need people on the ground there during the week. You need them on the Sundays to do the work. And if they're not willing to invest that money, the church is dead. Um, Well, no, I I just read a story where the Diocese of Bolton is doing something interesting and innovative in the uh, 21st century here. They have hired a woke. Well, okay, the Diocese of Bolton has gone wokeity-woke by hiring a transgender dean. It's the Bishop of Manchester has a suffragan who's the suffragan of Bolton, mm-hmm. and they have an archdeaconry of Bolton and Rochdale, I think. I think I saw that. Well, the Bishop of Manchester has decided to get a pair of mismatched bookends. He's he's hired Matthew Porter from St. Michael Le Belfry in York, an evangelical parish. Mm-hmm. A fellow on his website says he's a Bible-centric, Christ-believing fellow. He's a conservative evangelical. He's done quite well. And he has been made the suffragan bishop of Bolton within the area of the Diocese of Manchester. At the same time, the Bishop of Manchester, uh, I want to say Peter Walker, but that's not right. The Bishop of Manchester has hired Rachel Mann to be the first transgender archdeacon in the Church of England. Rachel Mann was once a man, and now she he she identifies as a woman she's way out there theologically uh you know uh she describes herself as a feminist queer theologian and so you've got these bookends you got a conservative evangelical and you've got a transgender feminist queer archdeacon and when push comes to shove what do we read in the press statements the new art the new bishop elect is very happy to work with the new transgender archdeacon do we see the new trend transgender archdeacon saying i will conform to the doctrine and discipline of the church of england no she mm. does not he does not mm. they they talk about you know gaia and the spirit of you know love and the feminine divine and all that silly stuff yes stuff, stuff. heresy uh, stuff no yeah so what so but it, you I have to ask myself I don't know Matthew Porter I assume he's a great guy um, everything that you see about him is to like uh, from my perspective but I think part of the price to pay to become a bishop in the Church of England is to give up uh, I don't want to say principles but to go along to get along well if we've been watching the history of the Church of England in, in many of the dioceses in the last uh eight ten years uh they would pick a, a dozen rachels before they picked one conservative 
Yes. You know, they, they, they maintain this ra- ratio, uh, ra- ratio, ratio of 10 to 1. Um, I remember back in the 1990s, the Diocese of Connecticut was 1 to 4. One conservative for every four liberals. Here, it's, it's I'm hoping, 10 to 1. We'll see. Uh, oh, but we have Allah. Allah. The name, the word Allah, was heard in the New Castle Cathedral. And we need to talk about it because it's, it's an interesting. Uh, there's been some pushback about what, you know, Allah in the Middle East is referred to as God, the Islamic God, and the, the Jude- Judo-Christian God. Um, yeah. This, this is a story that, on one hand, is fun to get agitated about. Mm-hmm. Because um, liberals can say, oh, look at these troglodyte conservatives. They just don't want to be inclusive. And conservatives can say, look how stupid and sloppy the Church of England is because they're allowing Muslim prayers. Both are a little bit right, but both are mostly wrong. The, the details are there was a, an evening prayer service, choral even song, and people requests for prayers were taken. And whichever idiot clergyman or lay lay reader was collecting the prayers read a prayer that had been submitted by a Muslim and asking for prayers for Allah for this and that. So anybody with half a brain would have basically substituted the word God for Allah, no problems. But the the uh, the mistake was made and it blew up. Now, technically. Allah is the word for God in Arabic languages. In fact, on Anglican Inc., we had uh, a story about uh, Malaysia, where the Sultan of Mal- the the King of Malaysia, the Sultan, forbade Christians from using the word Allah in their prayer books because that should be reserved to to for Muslims. Um, while in the Middle East, in Jerusalem, in the Arabic language services, they say Allah for God. Mm-hmm. But no, there was no intention to speak of the G. This wasn't an Arab on vacation. No. <laughs> um, but to me, the sto- so the story is local incompetence. I don't. This wasn't a case of writing an ecumenical service like they did in Glasgow a few years ago, where uh, Kelvin, uh, oh, the dean, the dean there. Well, the dean. His first name is Kelvin. Uh, basically, in pushed and for uh, Muslim inclusion in the service and this was the spark that got Gavin in trouble and kicked out of being a Queen's Chapel because he said no you can't do that and he was right but this isn't a case like that it's rather just some idiot but then it speaks to the lack of leadership in the Church of England that the Church of England right now is so brittle so insecure its leaders are so inconsequential that these little incidents, which you're always going to have dumb people in this world, cause a disproportionately high amount of grief because there's no trust, there's no goodwill, there's no sense that these people can be trusted. So it it speaks to a failure of leadership, just like the Unite story is a failure of leadership of the bishops, of the people who should be taking care of the clergy to do their job. Here we have a failure of leadership of deans and bishops failing to speak clearly and to dissuade fears so that, you know, you just don't know if you can trust the Bishop of Newcastle with Christian doctrine. And for many clergy in their diocese, uh, they don't start off with that. No. Well, we don't start with with the supposition of trust. They have to has to be proven to it. All right, let's move on to another story. Uh, I have here Richard Payne has swim the diver. And it's interesting because in the last five years, I can think of notable people who've swum, swam the Tiber. Uh, Gavin Asherton from the show Anglican Scripted uh, swam the Tiber. Uh, Michael Nazarali went to the Roman Catholic Church, uh, a handful of others. And Michael Nazarali left a bishop and was made a bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. Monsignor. Made a Monsignor. Made a Monsignor. Monsignor. Uh, Gavin left a, as a bishop and arrived as a layperson and ha- has not been able to uh, move back into the, the clergy fields in the Roman Catholic Church. And there's just no consistency with what how that happens. With Richard, what's his last name? Payne. Payne. 
uh, if you looked at his employee file, you would see there's not a real good um, Roman Catholic pedigree to, to say, hey, we want this guy. What is this inconsistent story, George? Well, there are converts to Roman Catholicism who do so out of conviction. Mm -hmm. Gavin Ashenden was one. I would assume Michael Nazarelli is another. Mm -hmm. And then there are converts to Catholicism who have so messed up their lives and careers that this is the only option left for them. Uh, Peter Ball, the former Bishop of Gloucester, who went to prison for being a child molester, when he was all said and done, he was received into the Catholic Church. Uh, Richard Payne was Bishop of Monmouth, and for the last year and a half, two years of his episcopacy, he was on leave. And no reasons were given, but we all sort of knew it was a personal failing. Um, and there were lots of rumors, which I won't repeat about the reasons for this failing, but uh, his tenure was not good. And he left the diocese in a total mess. Now, Payne backed women clergy. He backed gay clergy. He backed the full church in Wales agenda. He was not an Anglo-Catholic holdout of any sort. So two, three years after he sort of left active duty, he now reappears being received into the Anglican ordinariate in England, the, of ordinary to the chair of St. Peter. I'm sorry, ordinary to the of Our Lady of Walsingham. St. Peter is the U.S. one. And he's going to be ordained as a priest to serve as a Catholic priest. Which begs the question, did he sober up? Did he clean up? Did he come to, did he get his act together and then have a faith conversion? Or is this basically he wants to keep busy and he's unemployable in the Anglican world because of his past screw-ups, but the Catholics will take him and uh, make things all shiny, new, and clean? I don't know. Uh, but this is not uh, a trophy if I were a Catholic uh, apologist that I would be hanging on the front row of uh, convert trophies. All right, on to our next story. If people don't know, uh, the church I attended in um, uh, Connecticut uh, before we left for the last few years met in Bridgeport. It met in a synagogue. It rented space in a synagogue um, as it's trying to transi transition into a permanent church. And we, you know, we had trouble with that. You know, we talked to our bishop. I don't have a problem. The bishop said, nope, we had no trouble with that. And uh, it was a great deal, great price. And it just shows that there's an ecumenical way that we can still have traditions. And, you know, we're kind of preaching something. You, you know, ah, okay, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. However, there's a story breaking out uh, where a ACNA parish in the Church for the Sake of Others has decided to rent from a tech parish. And I, is this a bridge too far? Uh, certainly, the, it can be argued that it's not ecumenical. You know, it's quite a story, George. Yes and no. Um, it is a story because it was written up by the diocese, Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles as the good thing. Mm -hmm. Bob Williams, who Kevin, you and I knew, he used to be the National Church's press That's officer right, yeah. mm -hmm. and then uh, under Catherine Jefford Shorey. And then when uh, Curry came in, he went back to Los Angeles, where he came from. Bob Williams, who's a partnered gay man uh, and is fully on board with the tech agenda, wrote this laudatory story about how uh, a uh, parish on the uh, east side of Los Angeles, Fiscal Parish, was renting space to the Church of the Resurrection, La Res, they called it, an ACNA church of the Diocese of uh, C4SO and how this is wonderful, how we can work together. And though we do not worship together, we have many common interests for helping the community, serving the poor, reaching out to the homeless, addressing the major social issues that bedevil Los Angeles County. And the response in some circles within the ACNA was utter horror, shock and dismay that by meeting in an Episcopal church, this, AC, this C4SO parish now has cooties, that uh, it will be importing the tech disease into the 
purity of the ACNA. And I think it's sort of funny because, you know, Kevin, your parish has running, been running from, your old parish in Connecticut had run it from a synagogue. Yeah. And you've not been, they've not been accused of being secret Judaizers or anything. No, the you opposite. Had, we, 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 sandwiches at the, the yeah. at, and hot dogs at the at the barbecue, didn't you? And, and I, now there's a suspicion among some quarters of C4S, or whatever they do, they're damned until they're proven innocent because of uh, some of the actions of some individuals in that diocese. And I think we just, my personal counsel is, you know, don't worry about it. I mean, if you got a cheap rent, and I do stuff here with the Lutherans down the street, and I do stuff with the synagogue uh, around the corner. So at a certain point, George, you, it's not like you're renting from Hooters, you're, you're renting from the Episcopal Church. It, exa exactly, I mean, uh, and there's the Episcopal Church, and there's the Episcopal Church. I mean, I went to Gafcon. Nobody had any problems with my being there. I was one of two Episcopalians. The other was Ashley Null. Nobody has a problem with Ashley Null speaking and lecturing and informing them. Uh, we're both, uh, what's the word you were going to use, Kevin, uh, to describe Ashley Null and myself? I forgot. <laughs> kosher. It's kosher, there you go. Yeah. We're kosher. We're kosher Franks, kosher, kosher wieners. Uh, <laughs> it, it depends upon the individual. They're... Um, you know, when I was in seminary, I went to a, a seminary that was not liberal, not conservative, just was Yale, which you could say in the general is absolutely whacked out way out there. But I had a wonderful education, wonderful people, and I was formed in a tradition that I maintain to this day. Unless you're weak minded or weak willed or easily influenced, uh, you're not going to get sucked into the blandishments of Satan by uh, sharing a, a bathroom with the Episcopal Church. Uh, um, I just don't see that happening. No, but, it, it's a cute story uh, for what it is, but no, I have to agree with you there. All right, so let's see here. That's one, two, that's all six doors. We've got it, it's all done. All right, George. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Kevin. Thank you for joining me at a, uh, a diesel engine shop. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Congan. You've been watching episode 807 of Anglican Unscripted.